super excited that you're able to join us this afternoon or this morning, depending, or this evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we're going to start in just one more minute. We're just going to give everybody an opportunity to uh, join the webcast. I hope you are enjoying the photos. Here are some photos that I selected from uh, Katrina and I, uh, just to show some pivotal moments in our lives over the last uh, few years. Okay. So welcome. Hi. Hello, Katrina. Hi, Seth. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very well. How are you? I am really well. Um, and I'm so thrilled uh, that you're able to come and do this for us today. Um, before we get started into our conversation, um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to um, introduce everybody to City Women's Network um, and what we're doing. And also just a minute or two in terms of the charity that we have. Um, we're so thrilled uh, that Katrina has been able to do this for us today. City Women's Network is a professional women's network here in London. Um, it has been in existence for over 40 years and it really provides some fantastic support for professional women in London. Uh, it provides developmental opportunities, professional networking, um, mentoring and, and that broader support structure for women uh, in London. So I'm so thrilled that we were able to pull Katrina into the fold this evening and share some of her experiences and learning as well. Um, and before I before we start, it would be remiss of me to not say thank you to everybody. Um, I know that you've all donated to be part of tonight's or this evening's webinar. And we have been really overwhelmed with the fantastic support that we've received. So we've raised over £6,000 for our charity of the year. And our charity is Wellbeing of Women. And they are a fantastic charity that supports uh, peer-reviewed research into women's health. Um, and many of you may not know them because their research is um, it's in a specific area, but it has such a profound impact on all of our health and well-being. And the investment today will pay dividends into the future for our children, for our nieces, um, for, for our friends, for all of those in the future. So we're really investing in the future. Their research um, helped identify the link between the HPV vaccine and cervical cancer, um, which is now used, and, and the HPV vaccine is, new, is widespread and used uh, throughout the world now. Uh, they're doing some amazing research into menopause and treating symptoms. Um, and also the, the research found uh, was one of the finding links of how taking folic acid is so beneficial uh, for pregnancy and, and for pregnant women. So it's so fantastic that all of the funds that we've raised today will go to support uh, well-being of women. The money that we've raised this evening will enable them to fund a junior doctor on their first piece of research for you know between three and six months. And that is phenomenal in terms of what we've been able to do. So I'm so proud of that first and foremost, and thank you very much for, for enabling us to do that. So, Katrina. Yes. Little sis. It's amazing. No, I think right. it's incredible that. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, as I cut you off. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you'll find out as we talk to each other this evening is that uh, we um, we are are two bolshy women um, who <laughs> part of a bolshy family who are very comfortable uh, challenging each other. Um, stopping each other, questioning each other, but also supporting each other. And I think that's been fundamental all the way through our lives that we've supported each other throughout. So I'd like to start off, if it's okay, um, and hear a little bit about, well, we can share a little bit in terms of what it was like growing up and, and how kind of our formative years have changed and evolved our lives and, and had such an impact on what we've done um, through the rest of our careers. So, um, I thought I'd maybe start, I I'd maybe start off. The fact that I am the sort of like black sheep of the family. <laughs> yes, there is that. <laughs> so Katrina um, and I, uh, we're siblings next to each other um, and we shared a bedroom for pretty much our whole we are, childhood. We are, we are five, uh, five siblings plus yeah. a foster brother and a foster sister. So really we're seven. So we're from a very large family. Um, Good old Irish Catholic family, I think you'll find yeah. is the general sense is there. 
And, and it's interesting because, and, and we should take this moment to point out that in those photos, there was a lot of sistering going on, but we do have brothers who are incredible and very accomplished and we love them dearly. And yes, we, we probably don't give them as much public love as we should. So here's a big shout out to Kevin and Francis and David. We love you. We love you. Uh, <laughs> the, the family WhatsApp would be relentless if we didn't mention them and give them a shout out. So yeah. here's to you guys. But it is interesting. I think, I think having come from such a large family, it naturally breeds a certain amount of independence. Um, I think partially that's because in many ways our mom was so busy. Um, there was always children around when she wasn't having her own. She was either fostering children or looking after other people's children. Yep. And so there was a lot of um, taking care of yourselves. <laughs> and, and each other. There was taking care of each other. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that you can see that in you know, even though we're, I would say we're all very close, but we are all very independent. And, you know, most of us have gone on and lived abroad at some point. And, um, but I, yeah, I, I think also, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's funny because, you know, all of us have kind of become quite successful in our own ways, but we're all very different. I mean, I'm the only one without a real job. <laughs> <laughs> <That's been> proven <laughs> by COVID. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Like, what what do you think about how we grew up? Like, how it's how it sort of informed how we went on to live our lives. Well, I th I think there is that. Um, there's definitely that piece of um, being able to play well with others. I think is probably an underlying piece of oh, yes, the most part. Yes, we, we, we do um, that. So I, I think there was there was that piece. I think that that independent streak is a, a real crucial piece. Um, I think you know there was a, the the piece of if you didn't shout loudly enough, you didn't you, you didn't get heard in some instances. So I think that instilled a very much an idea of well, if you want something, then you need to go and get it, and you need to shout loud enough to to go and get that as well, and you need to make your point heard. Um, and I think the other piece with with our parents, I think our parents were very honest with us about pretty much everything. So there was there was a huge amount of honesty and transparency around money around what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis in the house and kind of what we were all doing and how we were all contributing or not. So. I don't think there was ever a sense of um well we weren't molly coddled <laughs> that's a what very good word, word. <laughs> <laughs> there was no molly coddling it was very much kind of pull your socks up and get on translate with it that for everybody i don't yes. even know what the translation of that is but, uh, uh molly coddling cotton wool, right there you go cotton wool um so i think yeah no i think that's that's a, a critical piece as well i think um you know, I was, I was reflecting on it. I think one of the things that, um, you know, we were brought up as, as in a big Irish Catholic family. And I think one of the things that, um, one of the things that probably disappointed our parents most was that uh, we stopped going to mass. Um, I think they're, they're hugely talking uh, about, proud. they still don't know. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes, we go every Sunday. <laughs> um, you know, I think they, they're hugely proud of all of our achievements, but I think that's that's one of the things that maybe somewhat disappointed them along the way. Um, oh, I think but... every every parent in Ireland is probably disappointed in that way. So <laughs> I think it's just really a sign of the times. Um, yeah. But I do think it's interesting. I mean, I think also, you know, we should, it's, we grew up in Ireland and in a particular part of Ireland that through our childhoods was a very... I mean, it was through the depression in the 80s, but it was also, we grew up right on the border. Um, and I know that that definitely informed sort of some of my psyche or makeup. I think the fact that, you know, our father was a police sergeant in a place that was very, um, maybe not welcoming to that. I think that mm -hmm. was also um, quite impactful on, on our lives. And maybe that's also what pushed us, I think, to all really strive to have the opportunity to sort of maybe leave. I mean, I have lots of fond love for Monaghan now, but I think when I was growing up there, I 
I sort of, I had this very strong ambition that I, I would get out of there. And yeah. you know, I, I think that a lot of us felt that way. And it was a very, um, in some ways, it was a very repressed place. And we were very much outsiders. And I yeah. think, um, you know, feeling that at a very young age has an impact on you. I mean, I, I remember from very, very young, um, a woman coming to our front door and I was a toddler and I remember standing at mom's legs and this woman shouting at mom, telling her that we should go back to where we came from. And, um, you know, I think things like that, they definitely, you know, inform how you view the world. But I yeah. think also having grown up in a, in a place with a lot of conflict, um, it, it makes you a lot more empathetic to other places in the world. And I think it's, it really allowed me to be able to travel the world and look at places in a much more open way where I think some people grow up with fear of other countries. Yeah. But I think we grew up in a place where people were fearful of when we were growing up there and you realize that it's just, you know, people are people no matter where you are. Um, but yeah. I don't know. Well, and, and I think that's a fascinating one. I remember, um, I remember having that urge to move and, and going to university. And I remember going in my first year of university and somebody coming up to me in a, in a as I was going into a club in university and somebody calling out that I was um, Jim Balfe's daughter. And I remember being horrified that I hadn't gotten away from as you talk about that conflict you know and and it was because it was such a it was such a, a strong element of the environment that we grew up in and that conflict that was there and it was kind we of the underpinning piece yeah um, i mean because our dad was known by everyone you know our, our dad was a local sergeant and i mean every single person knew who we were mm. before you even had to open your mouth <laughs> it's like it, it didn't tall. help that we were all you know massively <laughs> tall and you know all those things but um yeah, it was, and, and that was that was quite a hard piece as well because you could, you never were able to get away with anything. Everybody knew who you were, and uh, were able to tell everybody about it as well. Yeah. Uh, so, so just on that note, um, you know, we were on the on the family WhatsApp today. I just I do need to share this one because I thought it was quite funny. Um, I'd forgotten about it. Um, dear, dear, our older sister reminded me of the time that um, you got caught. Um, Oh, you got to share that. I was going to share that one because I thought that was quite funny. So you got caught on the bus going on a school trip with a bottle of vodka. That's, you put the story wrong. That you, you hadn't should... drunk? Like, what was that all about? So it was a school <laughs> tour. We stupidly, uh, a border town school went to Belfast for their... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was sensible. Tour, um, which was uh, organised by students. Um, but we were all staying in a hostel in Belfast and many students had acquired some alcohol. Okay. Um, and we, and some had started drinking very early and I was staying in a room with four of my best friends at the time. And we had started to see how there was a bunch of people getting into trouble and we were going to a Smashing Pumpkins concert the next weekend in Dublin. How very so cool when, of you. How very cool of us. But so when we noticed that people were getting in trouble, we were like, we're not gonna drink because we'll get caught. So we hid, <laughs> we hid the vodka in my tracksuit bottoms. <laughs> in nice, my classy. <laughs> and, uh, and then we were informed that they were doing a room search, the teachers. So my friend Dorinda, um, or Dorina, uh, jumped down before they could even get to our bags. And she was like, right, we might as well tell you, we do have some vodka, but we haven't drank any, but we have it. And at that point we were all like, Dorina, we could have got it. <laughs> um, and so we got sent home, us four girls and two guys who had been caught drinking. And so then we were known in school as the Belfast Six. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were sent home and we didn't get to go to Smashing Pumpkins because I was grounded. So yeah, thanks for that, Amory and Deirdre. You're sharing. very welcome. I, I, <laughs> I, thought we should, I thought we should share. I, th I, I thought sharing some of the love would be good. Um, uh, before I move on to talk about travel, I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, just some of the, 
the relationship that we all have and some of the sharing piece. I think, you know, one of the things that is, is critical for me is that I know my sisters, my siblings in general always have my back. And um, one of the photos that you saw on the, on the, the image there is, um, there's a photo of Katrina and I in Hong Kong. And uh, when my son, when my eldest uh, was four weeks old, mum and dad, not dad actually, mum was supposed to come to Hong Kong to hang out with me. Um, while I had this tiny baby and, you know, I was being superwoman. I didn't need any help, but I wanted mum to be around. I thought that'd be really cool to have her to spend a, few, a week with me and, and spend some time with the baby. And as mum was on the way to the airport, um, her doctor called and said, really sorry, you're going to have to turn around. You've got DVT. Um, and I had this tiny little child uh, in Hong Kong and I think I cried solidly for about three days. And then I got a phone call from my little sister who said, don't worry, I'm coming to stay. Uh, and little sis came and hung out with me in Hong Kong. And it was the coolest thing. And I was going through photos um, this week, actually, just thinking about this. And, uh, and I was coming across all these really cool photos of us hanging out in Hong Kong when Killian was this little, tiny little person. And it was just the coolest experience because it was, you know, you were kind of, you were in this, you know, you were transitioning out of, of uh, modeling, you were trying to get into acting. And it was, and it was this, it, I think it was a different time for you, but it was also like, it was a, a unique experience for me with a tiny baby. Um, and it was just such a great time for us to be able to hang out in Hong Kong and-, and, uh, and I just remember, a bit of a laugh. I remember offering to do, because you would express and I, I would said I would do the midnight feed. And I was just like, some nights I wake up and I go, did I do it? I don't even remember. Have I woken up? Have I not? <laughs> I think I used to actually wake up because I'd hear him cry and I'd walk into your room and hand you the baby and the bottle and then go back to bed. <laughs> you were a really amazing. good help. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's been incredible to watch you. You know, you say you thought you were superwoman, but very often you appear to be because... You know, you went to New York first. I, I was modeling and I was living in Europe and you moved to New York and I sort of followed you there and you had this very, well, what I would always consider a high power job. Um, and, really. But then, you know, you and, and Sean decided to move and you moved to Tokyo for a year and you've always been, I think, very fearless and very um, willing to sort of just go ahead and forge this new path. And then, you know, you moved to Hong Kong and you were like, yeah, I'm just gonna have my kids here by myself. And you know, it's amazing, but you very much have always been an inspiration and had my back always as well. You know, I think Thank you. It's, been, it's been nice that we get to, get to help each other out. And it's also as the sister who doesn't have a job half the time, <laughs> I get to be the one who can like fill in <laughs> and then, you know, when when mum can't, but now you uh, more than fill in when mum can't. So thank you. Um, I don't think I ever said thank you properly for that one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about. And sorry, I should probably mention this. Um, we have received so many questions. Uh, we've received so many questions this week. And what I'm trying to do is incorporate those questions into the discussion. We will leave some time at the end just to ask some specific questions. Um, so. Thank you for those questions, and we'll um, yeah we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. But let's talk talk a little bit about um, kind of the initial career in modelling um, and and your activism in modelling as well. I think is really important to highlight here. So I'd like to dwell on that for a few minutes because I know you you and Sarah Ziff did a huge amount of work in terms of as you were coming out of your modelling career, how you helped and supported models in the industry to get more support to get recognized more um and to really help them as they were either transitioning into or out of um a modeling career as well so i wouldn't i'd, I'd really like you to talk a little bit about that if you don't mind well i mean so to sort of go back i mean i i was in college in dublin i mean our parents very much uh wanted us all to go on and go to college and yes. get degrees and I, uh, I don't remember that being an ask i just remember that being that's what we're all going to do. Yeah, it was, 
uh, the only reason I remember when I was like, well, I want to go and study theatre and drama. Um, there was a big like, huh? <laughs> can't, <laughs> oh, fair can't you do that on something else? And, and I do remember even one of my teachers in school being like, you know, that's a hobby. You go get a different degree and you do that as a hobby. And I was like, no, this is what I want to do. Um, and, you know, so it was a bit of a, a, a fight to sort of get to go to do this drama course. And then at the end of my first year, I got scouted to be a model. And then it was like going to my parents and being like, so, you know, the way I was doing drama, I'm going to take a year out. <laughs> <laughs> and can, I just, can I just interject here for a moment? Your siblings teased you relentlessly for the whole period. I think our, our favorite phrase at the time was, you the model. A model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yes. Sorry. Full, full of support, full of support. Full of support. But yeah, it was, um, so, and, and you know, I, I, I modeled for a little bit in Dublin and then I got, well, a scout came over and I went to Paris. And, you know, I, I just remember it just being such a culture shock and also, you know, not being particularly successful in the beginning and struggling for money and having to come back to Dublin and do, you know, not the most glamorous jobs in Dublin to afford to be able to go back to Paris just to go to castings and pay my rent. And I remember, you know, struggling and, and people really have a misconception about what life is like for the vast amount of models. And I think there is not a huge amount of sympathy because people have this perception of like, oh, they're young and they're pretty and they get everything handed to them but the reality of it is very different. And so, you know, I really can't take too much credit for what really was Sarah's project that she started. Um, she started filming this documentary and her and I had become friends because we were at a casting um, for a very big house in Paris. Um, and they would routinely keep you there for hours upon hours to do a fitting. So you might arrive at 10 p.m. at night after having done a full day's work from like 7 a.m. in the morning and you could be there till four or five in the morning waiting for your clothes to be ready to do a fitting okay, and then to be at ready for work the next morning at like maybe 6 a.m. Like sometimes you would just go all night and you would they would have a couple of pillows on the floor and you could like fall asleep on the floor or not. And how I met Sarah was that Sarah was having like her first massive season and she was doing every single show. So she was exhausted and she was asked to do a makeup test and they'd put something in her eye and her eyes were streaming. And so I met this young American girl who was bawling her eyes out in a toilet and just exhausted. And, and I was one of, I mean, I was probably 21, 22 at this point, but I was one of the older girls. And I think I, I have always felt very protective over the younger people and younger women in, in, in the industry. And so we formed a friendship and then Sarah started doing this documentary and it just became a very natural organic thing that we started to do, which was to speak about our experiences and give voice to all the girls. This is before social media, like nowadays people can tweet about it or whatever, but nobody would listen to you. You didn't have an opinion. And yeah. And I think that that's, you know, I, it's something that I'm probably throughout my entire life, I've always spoken up. Yes, <laughs> probably you, you have. <laughs> um, you know, so not, not many people like it always, but I think, you know, it's that thing about giving voice to people who don't have a voice and, mm -hmm. and trying to rectify things. You know, I think it's out there that I, I got hugely ripped off in Italy for an obscene amount of money. And there was no recourse because a model isn't even a legally recognized profession, or at least it wasn't then in Italy. And so unless I wanted to sue every single designer who had ever hired me to try and recoup my money, there was no recourse for us to get any money back. And so all of these things sort of snowballed into us, um, putting it all into a documentary, trying to get some people to listen and take, a, you know, take awareness, take action on our behalf as well. Um, and Sarah, you know, I then dipped out of the industry, um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I still lend her my support whenever I can, but she has really continued to fight that fight and it's quite amazing the work that she's done. And so I really don't want to take too much credit for it because she's pretty much been the sole fighter for that for so long, but it was, it was definitely part of my 
also coming to the decision that I was spinning my wheels in an industry where I wasn't passionate about it as well. So that sort of informed my decision to leave. So let's talk a little bit about your decision to leave and, and about that transition, because, you know, as your sister, I was, I wouldn't say I had a front row seat to that, but, you know, there were times when we came over and visited you in LA and, you know, and saw how you were trying to make that transition doing acting classes and, and getting involved in different things. And then, you know, kind of just before things started to happen, as again, as your sister, I was, I remember being really quite worried about you in terms of, because I had, I had to phone you and ask you for some money. <laughs> well, at that point, <laughs> which I was very happy to pay my rent. Please, somebody, please. And but I remember, as you know, again, as as your sister, thinking, you know, it was, it it's such a tough industry. You had gone from one very tough industry where you're being judged on a daily basis about how you look. Um, and how you're standing and are you thin enough and are you edgy enough and are you this and are you that to another industry which rightly or wrongly seems to judge in the same you know in the same way but slightly slightly different wrong. so I, I think it's quite different I mean it feels very different um no I think it was very hard I mean but I you know I had I had come to the point where I was living in New York modeling was starting to change for me as well. I was doing more catalogs, less runway. It wasn't as fun. And I was 27, 28, turning 29. And all of a sudden it was just like, I am miserable. I am not living a life that I want to. I was in a relationship that I was very unhappy in. You know, there was just a number of things and, and I, I just, I remember having a reckoning with myself being like, is this the life that you want? Like you yeah. are the person who gets to choose and decide. So, yeah. you know, so choose and decide. So choose. And, and, you know, and in many ways, having watched you move to Tokyo and start over again, or move to Hong Kong and start over again, you know, I think those things were an inspiration. And so I decided to move to LA and it was very much, you know, start from the beginning. I knew one person there. I read an article about an acting coach. I went to that acting coach. Um, and, you know, it was, it was definitely a lot of, I, I used to call it, I lived in a bubble of delusion because you have to, like, I, I was like, it's just going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out. It's going to work out. I, <laughs> put it up there, I don't have a plan B or C. And so it's just, but I, but I knew, I knew how I felt when I acted. I knew right. how I felt from a little kid anytime I got to do it. And I knew that it felt like the most natural thing for me to be doing. And yeah. so that felt like, I, it has to work like somebody has to give me a job. Um, and so, yeah, it was very much, I think it was, it was amazing though, because I came out of modeling, uh, an insecure, you know, shadow of myself, I think. And I spent probably a good two and a half to three years really rebuilding myself and, and going to a lot of classes and, you know, meeting people and, you know, sort of finding a network. And, and I think that, you know, I, I'm so glad that I got those years. It was, it was kind of like me recouping those college years that I never finished yet. <laughs> no, I, no I, I, I totally agree on that one. Sorry, I, I'm getting a refill of my wine here. So excuse me for just a second. Um, I think there's one of the things that I would say, I think is, is true. Thank you. True about, um, True about all of us, and, and maybe this is part of growing up as well, I think we all have that determination if you see something that you're not happy with, if you are experiencing something that you're not happy with, you need to agitate and make that change. And it's something that I've lived by myself is from a career perspective, you know, I've hit moments in my career where I've been really unhappy with something and it's been, okay, well, what can you do? What can you change? And you're not gonna be able to change everything in one day, but you have to then kind of plot out what are the things that you can change? What's the time frame that you're going to work within that? And I think you've done that. Where we're different. 
so you, me? You, this is where you and I differ. You plot and you look <laughs> at things and you go, right, how am I going to plan my way out of this? And I go, ah! <laughs> Dive in. <laughs> Just going to go do this and see if it works. But I do think, you know, it's interesting watching all of us. I mean, you know, I think every single one of our siblings, especially because I don't think our parents ever really pushed us in the sense of they weren't cheerleaders. You know, if you they wanted to- tiger parents. Hmm? They weren't tiger parents. No, and, and you know, if we wanted to do something, you know, mum was really busy, dad was really busy. So if you wanted it, you had to sort of make it happen yourself. You know, they yeah. weren't going to be driving us around to every single rehearsal or training practice or anything. It was like, it's on at that time figure it out. And I think that that has stood to all of us. Yeah. No, entirely. So now I have, I have a number of things that I need to ask you about here. Um, okay. One of these uh, comes from Sophie. So Sophie, if you're listening, hi. Um, so hi, what, Sophie. Was, what was George like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so can um, you he was hopefully lovely. get that reference? Um, he was lovely. He was you know, that was such a, a dream job. And I, I just remember being very, uh, like, it, kind of overwhelmed by everything and everyone. I mean, like, Jody and George and everything. But George, I'm, I'm just going to say, it's interesting when you meet some of these guys because you think they're going to be, like, these really suave, impeccable dressers from moment yeah. to moment. Generally, when they show up to work, they're kind of in dad jeans and t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. you, you know that there's like 350 hearts that are just crushing right no, now <laughs> he's so lovely he was so lovely and very funny i mean i think everybody knows he has a great sense of humor but you know we didn't have a huge amount of crossover in terms of our scenes together but he was just such a welcoming humble cool guy who wore normal clothes <laughs> 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 so let's let's talk for a minute about the big break right so there was there was a number of little little and i shouldn't say little there was a number of stepping stones let's call it that hey, so every one of my non-speaking roles <laughs> <laughs> there was there was the one with your shoes in the devil wears prada remember vaguely oh, yeah. <laughs> i remember that because i went to see it being filmed um and then um then there was there was Michael Caine's slightly younger wife. Yes. <laughs> but that's okay. It's all good. I think, I think I sat next to him either on his 78th birthday. He, he had his birthday when we were shooting and it was something, I think he was 78 when we were shooting and I was like, oh, I'm 32. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Not a cringy moment at all. <laughs> he was lovely though. Another, I mean, I, yeah, I've been so lucky. You, you absolutely have. Um, so I remember, um, I remember ha speaking to you when I was in Hong Kong, um, and it was a Saturday evening. And I remember being, I had, we, we'd had the conversation about money, and uh, and I remember saying to Sean, I need to start calling Katrina more frequently because now I'm a bit worried. Because um, we used to speak most Mondays when I was going into work. It was Monday morning for me, and it was Sunday evening for you. And I remember thinking, I need to increase the call volume here because I'm actually a bit worried now. Um, and then I remember getting a call uh, on a Saturday night, my time. And you said, there's two big things. There's two big opportunities. I'm going to get one of them um, and I'll let you know. And I remember being so excited. And you're, And one thing that you, some of you may not know about Katrina is that she will never, ever give any of us details about any of the work that she's doing until it's signed because she thinks it's going to be jinxed. So she wouldn't tell me anything about it. <laughs> I am very superstitious. You're really superstitious. So she wouldn't tell me anything about either of them, but she said they're both big, they're both really cool. Um, I love how I was so confident one of them was going to happen. There was you, a chance you, that neither would happen, but you know. No, you were, you were completely convinced that one of them was going to happen, which obviously okay. it did. Um, and then I waited and I didn't get a call. And I remember going, oh, shit. <laughs> we've, we've, gone, we've gone for neither option. Um, and then you phoned midway through the week and you're like, and I'm moving to Glasgow. <laughs> and, 
And I remember it was, it was August. It was the end of August, wasn't it? No, it was September. September. And I remember thinking in Hong Kong at that stage, it was like still really hot. <laughs> and Katrina was in LA, which was really quite beautiful at that time of year. I remember thinking, ooh, it'd be a bit chilly. Uh -huh. <laughs> still and is. Thus, pardon me, and it still is. Still is. And thus began Outlander. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that there are lots of people on the call who um, are really massive Outlander fans um, and uh, would love to hear a little bit about your role in Outlander. Um, I think what I would love to hear you talk about is how you've used your role in Outlander to um, really change the dial and change the narrative a little bit. I know we've talked a lot about the fact that it is a platform around strong female characters and how you've done a huge amount of work around equal pay and things like that as well. So um, I'd love to hear some of that piece, if you don't mind. Um. I mean, you know, it, it's it's interesting. I think everything happens to you, or at least it happens to me when, when I'm ready for it. Right. And I, I don't think if Outlander had happened three years before, I would have been able to deal with it or, you know, and I'm, I'm glad I, I modeled before I ever became an actor because I definitely wouldn't have been able to handle something like this in my 20s. But, you know, I had never done TV before. I didn't even really understand what I was getting into. I didn't really understand what being number one on a call sheet meant. Um, I didn't, I didn't have- I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, it, usually you're the lead, but it comes with an, un, an undefined amount of responsibility. You sort of lead the cast, you set the tone on set, um, and it's, it becomes very apparent very quickly what, what a, an effect you have on the entire atmosphere or the entire feeling on a, on a show. And, you know, I have to say that Sam is also, we share that in many respects. I mean, I think season one, it was sort of much more, I was on, set a lot more than he was but since then it's been very much 50 50 and we've taken that responsibility i think together as we've really taken that very you know we haven't taken it lightly i think we we yeah. recognized early that it's really important <laughs> to make sure that every single person who walks onto your set feels welcomed that that it's just not cast that you are respectful to crew that you understand that every single person's job has a, a value and an importance because we are all cogs in a huge wheel um but you know it's it was it was a huge learning curve i was an unknown unknown actress coming onto a show i would have signed any contract pretty much i mean i i had these two opportunities and and i think the decision was made for me in the end i didn't get the other job i got this job and I remember my lawyer saying to me, you know, it is for six years. And I was like, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> if I get a job for six years, that's going to be great. Um, and, but I, I had no idea. I had no idea I would be moving my entire life and moving to Scotland for this in 10 time. days. I'm doing so in 10 days. But I think, you know, and I think what greatest things about this job and, and how I've been able to parlay it into other stuff. A lot of that was actually fan driven. And I have to give a huge amount of credit to the fans because in the very beginning, you know, while I was living in LA, I would volunteer in a couple of local charities, myself and my friend Carolina, we did reading to kids. We did storytelling, which is a, you go in and teach kids about how to craft storytelling and all this kind of stuff in schools. And we would also volunteer down at the union in Skid Row, but I wasn't part of any kind of organization. And Sam had already been running marathons and been working with Bloodwise. And so when my casting was announced, really fans were like, who can we donate in your honor? And this was something that I had never experienced before or been a part of before. And it was a huge wake up call where I was like, oh, wow, like this actually comes with 
a responsibility and yeah. an opportunity to be able to pay it forward in a really nice way. Yeah. And I remember sitting in my room in Glasgow doing research and trying to find a charity that resonated with me with the work they were doing. And, you know, we have uh, our neighbor, their daughter had just passed from cancer. Um, and I was thinking about her and I also had a friend who had passed in Los Angeles from cancer and I, I wanted to find something that was global and non-denominational and not affiliated in any way with a sort of religious organization. So it was welcoming, but I also wanted to find a young charity that had, you know, who would really benefit from some help. And so that's why I started working with World Child Cancer and I've sort of gone in circles now. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> know what right. I'm talking about anymore. But that's that story. Um, okay, well, I'm going to point you in a different direction then. Okay. So, strong female characters and how oh, yeah. there's, there's been lots of questions around strong female characters. Um, and I, and, and we have had this conversation a couple of times because I've, I talked to you when, uh, in the first couple of seasons of Outlander in terms of Claire's a strong female character and how do you use that as a way of um, and take that outside of work as well um, and do other things with it so talk to me a little bit about strong female characters and how you make them work I mean you know we this is a character that Diana Gabaldon created and I have just been very fortunate to step into those shoes but I do think you know, I, 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 I learned in the first week of shooting that I needed to stand up for myself. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know where that confidence came from. <laughs> I had zero right to be as sure or as clear of how I wanted to play this character as I, as I was, you know, there was a, a lovely woman. She had been hired as a, an acting coach. It was a very American sort of concept. And I think everybody was rightly nervous because I had such a minuscule CV um, and they had hired this woman and, and, and she was giving me advice that I just, I was like, that's not how I want to play this woman. And I think, you know, everyone has their own, idea of what a strong female woman is, or female character is and, and but it's it's the gambit and I, I don't think it's just being bossy and shouty and sometimes you know there was a tendency with the writers to always have Claire just like you know just bulldoze her way through scenes and and not be affected by things and I think that that's stuff that I really fought for was allowing that strength to also be vulnerability um, and I think, you know, I, I came, at, I came into this role at a, an amazing time for women in general on, in, in, in the entertainment industry, because it was this real, you know, golden age of not just me, but there's so many other shows where they had these central female characters who were complex and very different and it, you know whether it's Nurse Jackie or um, Homeland or you know even mm -hmm. Downton Abbey had so many great female characters who were all very different and I think it was just it was a real it, or it has been the last 10 years I think a real moment where it's like a third wave of feminism in, in, in a way um, where it's yes. like we're, we're also trying to figure out what that means for us. You know, yeah. I look at you and Deirdre and, and, you know, Kathy and Catherine and mom and everyone. And, you know, it's like women who have careers, who have families, who have hobbies. And it's like, how are you doing it all? But also where does the, you know, where is our role and, and what kind of things are okay for us to be like, uh, that's not something I want to do. You know, I, it's, yeah. I think it's just, um, have I gone off on another tangent again? No, no, but, no. I, I think you've <laughs> navigated that one, the answer and the <laughs> idea beautifully. <laughs> um, 
Okay, I'm quite conscious that time is marching on and I would like to ask a few questions. I mean, we could, we could talk here for about three hours. So we could do, and the fact that we're both drinking wine is, you know, <laughs> facilitating that quite well. well. We should stop it before we start shouting at each other. <laughs> that is true. Um, so a question that has come in a few different times and it's come in this evening as well um, through the chat. So thank you for the, for the questions coming in is, you know, as a, um, as a working actor, how are you dealing with COVID, lockdown, um, and how is that different for somebody like me, for example, who, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of us on the call who are used to going into an office every day and suddenly are not and are working in our son's bedroom or <laughs> the lounge. Um, so talk to me about your experience of, of lockdown and how that's different maybe for, from others and how you're coping mental health wise. Well, I think you and I talked about this um, and I definitely know I, I had a conversation quite a few weeks ago with my agent in LA who was having a really tough time because again, he is someone who goes into an office all the time. And I was like, well, Brian, now you know what every out of actor feel, you know, feels like <laughs> why you have so many stressed out calls. And in some ways, my life, at, you know, having been employed, unemployed, you know, you have spurts of incredible output in terms of work and then times of absolutely zero output. In some ways, you know, I, I recognize this kind of feeling and it's very difficult. And I, and I understand how someone like you, who is so used to a regimen and knowing what every single day is going to look like how that can be really really unmooring because mm. you know <clears throat> I'm sort of used to living with no plans <laughs> and no idea of what I'm what I'm doing or where I'm going that is um, quite true it's really impossible to pin you down on most things I can never plan a holiday I can yeah. never plan anything because I'm like well I don't really know what's going to happen and you know, everyone is now living with this. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. And I think, you know, for me, how I'm dealing with that and, you know, it goes up and down. I have good weeks and bad weeks. Um, but it's, it's a lot about self-care. You know, one thing I have been doing, I do yoga every day and that's more for my mind than it is for my body. Um, I've been, but it's also, it's strange. I'm never in one place this much. I've, I have not, I've slept in this apartment more in the last two months than I probably have in the two years <laughs> previous. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to be in one space this entire time. <laughs> um, but I'm also You're enjoying a lot of yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yoga. Uh -huh. But it's also, I'm, I'm working my way through like, I, you know, when everyone when in the beginning was like doing all this hoarding and, and shopping for loads of stuff, I was like, oh, I, I just now get to go through all the dry goods in my <laughs> cupboards that I buy when I'm here and never use and then leave and then come back to <laughs> later and they're all still there. Well, and so, and so, so I think you should all know, Katrina has been posting us all these really nice photos of, um, of some of the things that she has been cooking. And she, she said, me, she said, because we'd had a conversation around whether it was appropriate or not to use out of date stuff. And I was like, absolutely fine. Out of date pasta. <laughs> so she sent me a picture of dinner that she cooked. <laughs> and it was out of date pasta. And she was like, I think I've got away with it. <laughs> and then I got caught. And she but got it was, caught. It was a good three. Four years out of date. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we I think the house where mum literally it was you check the date by using your nose. Yeah, exactly. And your eyes. And if Good. it smells sort of okay, uh, you use it. And if not, you just cut off the bits that don't <laughs> smell okay. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. Um, so what else? Uh, so another question that has come through, um, there's quite a lot of questions around, um, who's your, who have you had as role models, um, from a career perspective, um, in your career? Well, I, I definitely think my siblings and my friends, I mean, you know, I, I had, an incredible acting coach uh, in LA 
Judith Weston, who had a huge influence on me. And she had these amazing classes, which weren't just acting classes. She would also have directors and writers and special effects people and editors. And it was this kind of amazing, this was networking process as well, but it was, it was people who were working in the industry. And one thing about acting classes is usually it's a bunch of actors. We're all trying to get a job. We're all in the exact same position. And yeah. the air of desperation is just thick. <laughs> <laughs> but this was an incredible place because it put you in touch with people who were actually doing the work and it demystified so much of it. And, you know, we would be in these workshops and it just, it really changed my entire approach to auditioning and to working with people. And I got my first jobs out of that um, class, which was amazing. Um, but I, I have the most amazing group of friends as well. And I, you know, uh, my friends who are also in the business in LA, we have this incredible support system. And I think it's, you know, my one friend in particular, who's the person I call every time when I have an audition, whether it goes well or bad or anything, Carolina, her and I are always in great support with that. But then my friend Dominica, who's not in the business, but her husband is, and, and they are an incredible support to me because they sort of talk to me about the other side of it. And yeah. you no, know, I think it's just really important in anyone's life. I, you know, and I, I, I find this, I'm quite an open person. Um, and I think not being afraid to ask anyone for help has really sort of benefited me, mm. uh, whether it's my sister for money <laughs> <laughs> or, or just advice or anything. I always think if you share your problems or if you share your worries, then it really does half them or it lifts the burden a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I entirely, entirely agree on that one. Um, I think the, the, another question that has come in is, you know, you've talked about your friends and you've talked about how you've maintained some of those relationships over a really long period of time. Um, but you obviously then have this other circle that you operate in, which I find fascinating when I see pictures of you with, you know, Christian Bale or Matt Damon or whomever it is. Um, you know, and it's, how do you kind of compartmentalize those two things and keep, stay who you are even though you've got these you know very lofty friends sometimes and then then the, you know us mere mortals the rest of the time well first of all <laughs> me and christian aren't exactly hanging out having dinner every night but uh, Fair enough. Good, good point <laughs> no, but i you know i think it's it's when you work with anyone you know working with christian was one of the greatest working experiences i've ever had he's amazing but he's also a lovely lovely man but his entire world is his wife and kids mm. it's the most beautiful thing you and and matt the same you know they are really humble family men and i think that's the kind of thing that you realize when you're in this business is that everybody is just normal. I mean, the circumstances around them aren't, but yeah. they are. Um, yeah. And I've been so fortunate. I mean, I, you know, the, the people that I've worked with, it, if I think about it in a sort of detached way, I'm like, what? That's insane. But when you're in it, it's really about the work. And, and I think that because I also place such a high value on being prepared and taking my work very seriously, I think I earn the respect that, you know, maybe if I came on set and wasn't as prepared and all those things, maybe I wouldn't get along as well with them. But, you know, I think it's like in, in your industry, I'm sure when you approach your work with a serious dedication, then it doesn't matter if somebody's the boss or the boss's boss or, you can you you can speak about anything because you know what you're talking about yeah no that's very true um okay there's a couple of birthdays that i would like us to call out if that's all right uh so we have a happy birthday to mandy who is 23 today happy birthday mandy big happy birthday and also to where did i see the other one laura who is 24 today happy birthday, happy birthday laura, laura. Um, I, I now feel really old. <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday. 
Um, uh, so Mary Lou asks, um, the money that you borrowed me from me, did you pay it back? Yes, I did. Tell, tell them when you paid it back, Katrina. <laughs> I don't even remember. When was it? Like a year later, two years later? Three. <laughs> uh, I lent you money at one point too, though. Sorry? I lent I you money know. at one point too. Really? really? Yeah. Really? Oh, I'm yeah. sure you did. <laughs> um, Okay, um, I think a couple, one more thing I, I think before we finish up, and I think this is an important one to, um, and it's one that I'm not sure how much this is publicized, but um, we've, we've talked a lot about this. You mentioned earlier um, that uh, your, you and your lawyer, or your lawyer sat down with you and said, you know, this is a six year contract, are you, <laughs> are you sure? Um, and we've had a lot of conversations around, um, as you go through renegotiations, how do you do that? And how have you done that? Um, and how you've gone in to those negotiations to ensure that you are, um, you know, paid appropriately for what you do. And I think there's, there's that big disparity in your industry, but also in so many industries around the gender pay gap. Um, so I'd love if you wouldn't mind to just talk for a, minute, a few minutes on well, we've got two minutes um, on, on what you did and how you did that successfully um, on Outlander and potentially on other things as well. Um, well, I think, you know, you have, unfortunately, it's really not until you're in a position where you have some kind of clout that you can, or you've done work. I mean, that first year of Outlander, I was paid abysmally, but um, <laughs> I was a new actress and I, 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 like, I really had to prove myself and I worked my ass off. I worked insane hours and yeah. never complained and showed up and knew my stuff every single day. So I think by the end of that first year, everyone could see that I was a dedicated hard worker and that I was an asset to the show and to the company. And so I think at that point, then you're in a position when you have proven yourself to advocate for yourself. And I think I've never been afraid, you know, in, in this second <laughs> industry, <laughs> I, you know, in my twenties, it was very different, but, and I think also the experience of having been a model and having gone through this kind of world where you are very much a commodity that is disposable. I think now, because I know my value, because I do work hard and I can see the value in that, that I, I am quite comfortable with saying what I want. And I think that that's something that all women need to learn. I think for men, it's very easy. Men find it very, very easy to sort of go out there and, you know, in, in other aspects of my life, I mean, when I'm speaking through a lawyer, I, it's really easy because I get to tell him what to really go into. And I think if, if I would probably find it different if I had to walk into a room and sort of advocate for myself. I mean, I think I'm probably, I might be there now, but I do think we need to learn how to take the emotion out of things. And I, I have a friend who's an artist in LA and she's this incredible artist and her stuff is amazing. And she would talk about having this, and it's sad that she had to do this, but this is what she would do where she would put this idea of a male artist in her head. It was then going to advocate for her. And he would, and she would sort of channel him about what he, what she would think he would say for himself. And it's very, because I think as women were so scared to be seen as difficult and we are and i know that i have acquired that monkier moniker 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 um monkier moniker uh occasionally because i do now speak up for myself a lot and i think as women we have to sort of not be afraid of being called difficult because they're going to call us difficult no matter what anyway so and i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to <laughs> stop us there <laughs> Now, I, I would like to say a massive, massive thank you. This has been the most fun hour that I've had this week. So uh, a big cheers to you, little sis. Um, thank you. It has been so wonderful. Cheers. Um, 
I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much on behalf of City Women's Network. Thank you on behalf of Wellbeing of Women. Um, and I know that we're going to make this uh, recording available as well and hopefully generate some um, money as well for your charity. So huge thank you, Katrina. Um, thank you. I know everybody on the call also says a huge thank, huge thank you. So good night, everybody. Good luck. Cheers, Have a great everyone. rest of the day. Cheers. Um, I hope you're all having a glass of wine as well. Bye. <laughs> Bye.